I also want to thank Richard Sussman, uh, who established the Sussman Lecture Series with his late wife, Lila. The Sussman Lecture Series is dedicated to studying issues that define our public life and engaging students and citizens in constructive dialogue regarding these issues. I think our speaker tonight will help us do that. Uh, in that spirit, I'd like to point out that both the Iowa Republican Party and Iowa Democratic Party have been invited to send representatives here tonight. Um, welcome and thank you for being here. As a reminder, there will be a Q&A session after the lecture. If you have a question, please text it to 515-346-8587. That number is on your programs and on the screen. Um, we will collect the questions and pass them on to the speaker. If you'd like to post about the event on social media, please use the hashtag, uh, hashtag Shriver at Sussman, which is on the screen. Uh, in a moment, I'll turn it over to our undergraduate chief of staff, Stephanie Keel. Stephanie is a senior studying politics, economics, and law, politics, and society. She's been working at the Harkin Institute since she was a sophomore, and she's instrumental to the work we do here. Along with overseeing all the work done by our student staff, Stephanie is always willing to help <coughs> with any task from organizing large-scale events like this one to printing and stuffing name tags. We're excited to have here to introduce tonight's speaker. Please welcome Stephanie Keel. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Keel, and I have the privilege of serving as the undergraduate chief of staff here at the Harkin Institute. On behalf of the Institute, we are thrilled that you could join us for the fall 2023 Sussman Lecture, Dignity, the Foundation of a New Patriotism with Tim Shriver. Tim Shriver is married, a father of five, the chairman of Special Olympics International, and co-founder of UNITE an initiative to, to promote national unity and solidarity across differences. Tim began his career as an educator and subsequently founded and currently chairs the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, the, learn the leading school reform organization in the field of social and emotional learning. Shriver earned his undergraduate degree from Yale University, a master's degree from Catholic University and a doctorate in education from the University of Connecticut. He has produced six films, is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Fully Alive, Discovering What Matters Most, and co-editor of The Call to Unite, Voices of Hope and Awakening. Americans may be more divided than ever, but some say our disagreements aren't causing the division, but, but what we do when we disagree. At tonight's Sussman Lecture, Tim Shriver will discuss the Dignity Index, which was developed by his nonprofit, Unite, and share how it can be applied to solve the country's toxic political and cultural divides. This evening, Tim Shriver will share why dignity is the key to easing divides, preventing violence, and solving problems. Please, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming our fall 2023 Sussman Lecturer, Tim Shriver, to the stage. Thank you, Stephanie. Wow. I think we should just go to the Q&A, right? <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to everybody here at the Harkin Institute. Matt, thank you for hosting and welcoming Misha Lorato, who's my colleague here, has come with me. Thank you for welcoming us, showing us this extraordinary building. If you haven't had the tour, I highly recommend uh, that everyone take in th not just the purpose and the mission and the work of the Institute, but the physical structure that's been built here, which is really quite extraordinary in that it speaks so powerfully. Whether you have a hearing impairment, a visual impairment, an ambulatory impairment, it doesn't matter what your challenge is, what your difference is, what your, there's some way in which this building has tried to say to you, you're welcome here. And I'm very, very honored uh, to have learned that and to meet so many of the students, Jennifer Fear, who helps so much. I'm thrilled that the team from Special Olympics Iowa is here. If, unless they, oh yeah, there, there you guys are. Thank you, Joe and Stuart, for coming. Um, I have my, by the way, my Special Olympics and Des Moines Public School sweatshirt on. <laughs> Just a, I'm not running for anything, but it does sort of, <laughs> It does give me some sense. I want to thank Alex Bates, who I'm, I'm recruited already. Uh, and of course, I want to thank the Sussmans, and I, I want to thank uh, uh, Tom um, and Ruth. Uh, I, 
Tom said earlier when he was speaking before Ruth told him he had gone on too long, which I admired tremendously. Uh, <laughs> He said that, you know, my mother used to go into his office and ask for something, and he would try to say whenever he could, yes. And I just want you to know that all the things that Tom did for the country, the ADA, the uh, retirement security, a whole series, decades of public service work that produced so many important gains, the most important thing he did was say yes to my mother. Uh, <laughs> And I hope when this evening is over, the family tradition continues, because I have another ask that he doesn't know about. Uh, <laughs> but uh, to be in the presence uh, of one of our country's greatest s senators of all time, uh, it's something, yeah. I don't know if, if all of you in Iowa uh, take for granted that you can see Tom uh, at an evening like this, or see Tom at the grocery store, or see Tom at a restaurant, or hear from Tom and Ruth about their work. Uh, but you're, you're, it's, it's a gift, and maybe it's a gift that our country gives to all of us, that we raise people up from the citizenry and we bring them back. No matter how great their accomplishments, they're still one of us. Uh, but we have here a man who's helped define the country in all the best possible ways. Uh, and if I were just to sort of look at it and say, what's the, what's, the, what's the principle that's defined the Harkin legacy? I would say, and I'm not just saying this, uh, I would say it's dignity. Uh, it's treating people with dignity. And I think his track record, and it's, this is important for tonight's conversation, his track record of treating people with dignity got things done. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, does the alternative actually get anything done? It may feel good. If you need to feel good, I understand that. There's therapists in the room, right? That's important. Uh, but it, it don't, let's not kid ourselves that contempt and hatred make anything better. Uh, you have a living example of the alternative here. I'll get to that a little bit more. Um, so let me start with a bold statement. I think we're in, uh, the, in a period of uh, a new cultural crisis, almost a spiritual crisis. I don't think our crisis is economic. I don't think our crisis is largely political. I don't think it's the economy, stupid. I don't think it's uh, those things that are, that are uh, our greatest risk today. I think our greatest risk today is this issue, the walls of fear and contempt and isolation. And I think it's an issue that has not yet been named specifically in our culture. This picture uh, is of the opening ceremony of the Special Olympics World Games in June. They were held in Berlin, Germany. That young woman, Sana, came from a small rural village in Pakistan. 18 months before that picture was taken, every morning her mother got up and chained her with a padlock uh, as a way of protecting her. That was childcare, the best her mother could offer her. Uh, and this is her carrying the first Olympic torch into that stadium since 1936. <laughs> and that track right there is the same track that Jesse Owens ran on. And she's surrounded by 7,000 people with intellectual challenges on that field, all of whom would have been eliminated in 1936. You can't miss the idea that this woman, this young woman, Sana, her bravery, her guts, her courage brought her there, but the presence she brought to all of the rest of us was the idea that tribalism combined with competition, combined with hatred, combined with violence, that formula has to be overthrown. Uh, and yes, uh, she, she did it there symbolically, and with her life, she continues to do it. But I don't think we can underestimate either the possibility of change. There's so many people say nothing's going to change, right? A academic institutions are just dedicated to the alternative. But we will hear from, so sadly, many of our young people, there's nothing I can do. It, nothing ever changes. I love John Lewis's line. Anybody that says nothing ever changes didn't live my life. And anybody that says nothing ever changes didn't see this stadium 
I stood where Hitler stood in the, in the reviewing stand as athletes from the Ukraine got a standing ovation from 60,000 Germans with tears in their eyes, uh, cheering the president of Germany, the chancellor of Germany, standing there saluting people with intellectual challenges. So look, yeah, we, don't, we, we shouldn't be overly discouraged. Let me tell you where my story starts. Senator Harkin mentioned my mom. This is my mom in 1962. Uh, six years before the founding of the Special Olympics organization, which uh, I love so much. Uh, mothers were calling her during the spring and saying, do you have any ideas about my child with an intellectual challenge, where I could send them? There's nothing for my child, there's nothing for my child. Finally, my mother said to the last one who called, yes, there is something, I found something for your child, bring your child to my house. And we will have a camp here for your child. We will play games here with your child. We'll have pony rides here. We'll have swimming lessons. This is a child from an institution outside of Washington in 1962. Uh, this is the example I'm very, very grateful to be able to say I grew up with. This is before the March on Washington, if you're looking for imagery and ideas and about what was going on in this house. My mother's premise was simple. Everybody deserves dignity. No exceptions, no exceptions. No walls, no fear, no contempt is going to stop me. And all, you know, I, I won't, I shouldn't spend too much time on this because I can get going, but when my mother, uh, about a year before she died, and I said to her, you know, you should write a book. You grew up in a famous family. You had all these brothers around you who were in politics and getting influence and famous and all that kind of stuff. And you grew up as a woman who had her own agenda, her own passion. And she said, what would, no one would want to read my book. She said, all I ever wanted to do was teach children with intellectual disabilities how to swim. So this is as much a definition of her life, the small precision of her life that led to this catalytic change. I want to show you this one other picture, partly because Misha's here. This is one of the first group of departing Peace Corps volunteers. My dad, in the same period of time, was leading and launching the United States Peace Corps. And all of these people were getting on Pan Am, you, you can see in the upper right hand corner, Clipper Peace Corps. Um, and the message here is not what, I think sometimes people, service, Americans going to serve. But Misha could tell you, who was a two time Peace Corps volunteer recently, the point of the Peace Corps wasn't to serve, the point of the Peace Corps was to learn, to listen to learn the language, to live eye to eye, heart to heart, to build bridges of understanding. So I'd like to say that these examples in my life are often misinterpreted, but for me, in some ways, the question they left me asking is how do we create systems that cross boundaries? How do we create probabilities that people who live in the United States and people who live in Benin or people who have been treated as though they're less than human and people who have been treated with privilege. How do we bridge these gaps? And I like to think of this question here. The prof this is not a new question. Uh, for those of you who are interested in biblical literature, one of the great prophets of the Hebrew tradition writes this beautiful section on freeing the oppressed and giving your coat to those who are, who are, who are naked and feeding the hungry and caring for the child. And at the end of that long litany of gifts you're invited to give, the, the, the prophet writes, you shall be called the repairer of the breach. It doesn't say you shall be called the equalizer of mean uh, goods and services. He says you will be called a repairer of the breach. And what I want you maybe just to join me in doing now is identifying, I'm not going to call on you for this, but I, I'd like to bring your story into this discussion. Where's a breach in your life right now? Where's a person, a group, an identity that's on the other side of a gap that you're not crossing now or not being, no one's crossing over from you? Who's the person or group or identity that is just too different? It's just, I can't, ah, they're just, uh. He said, uh, Thanksgiving's coming up. Nah. <laughs> bring, that, bring that person or group into the conversation, if, if you don't mind. Uh, so 
you know, my, my, I've learned a lot from the Special Olympics movement. Here's lesson one. This is 1995. President Clinton was the president. He came to the opening ceremonies. This is at Yale Bowl in, in Connecticut. The only time a seated president ever attended the opening ceremony, sadly, it hasn't been repeated. But anyway, he's on the top rung of the stadium because the Secret Service wouldn't let him go down on the field. All the athletes are down on the field, and this is 95, so they all were given cameras, single-use cameras. There's enough people in here who remember what a camera is, right? <laughs> so they had these cameras, and one of the professional photographers looks over, and he sees a group of athletes, maybe from an African country, doesn't know where, and they've all got their cameras, and they're all aiming their cameras up at the president, and they're, but he looks closely and they're trying to get a picture and they all have their cameras backwards. <laughs> so he realizes they've never used a camera before, so he, they're wasting all their film. And he goes over and says, can I help you? You know, you're trying to get a picture of the president and the athlete says, he says, you have to turn the camera around and then push the button. And the athlete says, oh, thank you. He says, but if you look through the viewfinder backwards, it works like binoculars and you can see the president perfectly clearly at the top of the stadium. <laughs> Lesson one, we get each other wrong. We misjudge a lot, a lot. We judge books by their covers. We judge people by their labels. We assume the photographer wasn't a bad guy, volunteer, professional, generous, wanting to help. Not a, not, a, not, a, not a bad guy, but he saw through a distorted lens. He assumed. Think of the person on the other side of the divide. Are you sure that they're so different? Are you really sure that there's no way you could bridge that gap? Lesson number two. This is Ajara Silla in her moment of victory. Before every Special Olympics event, these words are spoken, let me win, but if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. Every one of these athletes has to look at most of the people in this room and take a chance on us because every one of them has been scorned, humiliated, or overlooked by us. So if they were to walk, if, if one of our athletes were to walk in here now, they would be being brave in the attempt just to stand in front of us. Look at Ajara. Look, can you see what place she came in? Think she cares? Did her best. That's all. Not waiting for us, someone else to tell her, it was, you know, that was really great. Not waiting for someone to take a picture and send it home to her mother. Most of us don't take a picture when we come in seventh. We like, I don't want to talk about it. Not a Jara, brave. Second rule of healing the breach is brave. So all these experiences have led me to this question that Senator Harkin alluded to before. After 25 years in the Special Olympics movement, I feel like these athletes, these experiences have been my greatest teachers in life. Not the greatest place I've served, the greatest teachers in life. I know maybe that's obvious, but let me repeat it. The greatest teachers. So if the message is everyone deserves dignity, isn't there some way we could learn this lesson as a culture? Like, it's not impossible. We took people, there were 200,000 Americans in institutions in this country in 1968 for life. 14 foot high concrete walls, barbed wire. In 1968, today they're almost completely empty. We can change. It's, it's not impossible. So I'm going to skip this. That's why I don't want to spend too much time. There we go. Uh, so here's the premise. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for conversation and challenge. The problem is a new issue in American political and cultural life. A spiritual crisis has led us to a, to a cultural addiction to contempt. If we don't solve that problem, we can't solve any others. Argument number one. Number two, it's not an accident. 
Uh, I won't force you to read all this stuff, but here's Matt Taibbi's analysis of what, he, uh, what Arthur Brooks calls the outrage industrial complex. There is a business model designed to make you afraid of people who are different from you. Uh, systematically pry families apart. That's the goal. Devotional anger. Does this, does this sound familiar? Devotional anger is the business model, right? So when you pick up your phone and you scroll and you pause on something that has a high level of hatred and contempt, you are paying the purveyor of that hatred and contempt. And the more you pay, the more I pay, the more the business model works, right? So this is not an accident. It's not an accident. It's a design. And I'm sorry to say, Senator Harkin notwithstanding here, because uh, half of my family's in politics, politicians have cooperated with the business model. There is not one single politician, I hope, Tom, maybe, you're, maybe you'll prove me wrong on this, who has not said to me, when push comes to shove, I had to go negative. It was either go negative or lose. So I went. Now, they're not saying they wanted to go negative. I'm not saying they had a desire, but I'm saying they cooperated with getting paid, raising money, by stoking devotional anger against their opponent. These are just recent quotes. Abigail Spanberger just is just talking about former Speaker uh, of the House. And this is a Mike Lee fundraising letter. We are under attack. The fight is, a, is in our homes. They're coming after us, right? This is. This breeds a kind of devotional anger. I won't spend time, I have two slides on this on Republicans and Democrats. Here's what you just, the ma major conclusion. We don't have that many differences of opinion. And when you see these gaps, for instance, this, this, all this is trying to say is, this is what Republicans think Democrats' point of view is. This is actually the same question asked to Democrats. So if you ask a Republican, the, the U.S. should have open borders. Do you disagree? Do you, what do you think uh, Democrats think? Well, Democrats don't disagree with that. Only 30% of them uh, will, will disagree with that. The actual number is almost 75% of Democrats, right? So we have this gigantic perception gap because the devotional anger has been so stoked. We haven't actually stopped to think. Do we actually... Would, would immigration reform, is immigration reform possible based on the issue? I'm not going to put Senator Harkin on the spot. I'm going to say I've spoken to so many people in the Congress, even right now, no problem. Politics won't let us. I spoke to a congressman not too long ago who was, went to his speaker and said, I want to be on the immigration, a Republican in this case, I want to be on the Immigration Committee. Why do you want to be on the committee? Uh, I've studied the issue for four years now in Congress. I think we can make a deal with Democrats. If you want to make a deal with Democrats, I'm not putting you on the committee. Anyway, we're not going to spend too much time on this. Here's, here's, here's the, the clear uh, outcome. Uh, contempt incites violence. Okay? One plus one equals violence. Contempt and speech leads to increases in anti-Semitism. By the way, this slide is a year old, so just don't think I just put this up there because of the last two weeks. I could have put it up six years ago, but we, we just put this together. Amanda Ripley has studied this all over the world, terrific journalist, by the way. Political speech, if I say horrible things about my opponent, I lead some people to feel licensed to be violent. Not everybody, but it's an inciting factor. It's not just violence. One in four Americans have broken off a relationship in their own families. Now, I don't know if everybody noticed the one line you guys giggled at was when I said Thanksgiving. <laughs> because probably at least half of us in this room are like, I don't know what's going to happen when they come home or when he comes over. <laughs> or when she speaks to him. This is our families being torn apart, not by differences of opinion, by contempt and hatred. 
One in three Americans polled, Republicans and Democrats favor secession. Have you heard that one? 28% of Democrats, 30% of Republicans the last time around, 31% of Republicans, say their state should secede from the union. Okay, uh, mental health issue. Look at these numbers, eighth, 10th, and 12th graders. Uh, if you look at this period, you know, when I was teaching in school, well, uh, actually, <laughs> over there, but we would report to the school board that we thought that one in four, one in five of our children had significant mental health challenges. Uh, and it was leading to dropout, it was leading to attendance problems, it was leading to violence in school and so on. Look at the number now. I can't do anything right. Half of our kids think that way. This didn't just happen by accident. And you can't tell it's the kids that, oh, we'll treat you out of this, we'll medicate you out of this. You can't, we, I'm all for treatment, very important. Where are my clinicians here? Where, where did you guys sit, the McDonald's? Yes, all for treatment, all for medication, absolutely necessary, more is needed. Support for uh, parity and the treatment of mental health issues is necessary. But you can't treat half, you can't, you can't put half the population in therapy. No chance, no chance. So we either have to look at the cultural factors that are contributing to this sense of isolation and defeatism, or we're just going to destine ourselves to a generation that on, is on the verge of completely checking out. Here's the political version of this. The first time in history that Pew has measured answers to this question, can Americans solve their own problems? The first time in history more than half of us say no. We can't solve, I mean, I grew up, the, those pictures of the United States with the, of my childhood and many of your childhoods and the stories from my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation and my great-grandparents' generation, the only thing we agreed on was when America finds a problem, we can solve it. Even when it's internal, we can solve it. We, and no matter how bad things are, we can do it, not anymore. So you say, well, this is just human nature. So this is a quick summary. Uh, our premise here is that things have changed, that the combination of the algorithms, which exaggerate contempt, social media, which never leaves you alone, especially if you're 14 years old, no escape, right? Politics, which is now rewarding demonizing, the media, which is monetizing it, and the decline in religious and civic institutions, results in increases in violence, social and emotional pain, failing institutions of governance, civic life, and faith. So that's all the bad news. Here's the good news. The good news is we can do something about it. Donna Hicks has studied the post-apartheid South Africa, the post-troubles Northern Ireland, has worked with people who have been on the opposite sides of deep divides, and says in conclusion from her work and her work with Bishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, that the most important thing in human experience is the desire to be treated with dignity. Uh, from a more spiritual perspective, if that's your uh, comfort zone, uh, Richard Rohr writes that we're moving in a direction where nothing less than an inherent original goodness and a universally shared dignity can get us through. If we're in a cultural shift moment, the premise of both political science here and spiritual or, or religious guidance is We've got to find a new foundation. You can't just be Iowans against Missourians, or Catholics against Protestants, or Jews against Muslims, or black against white. It's not going to work anymore. So here's my favorite quote from the archbishop. He's, uh, I was in a thing where he was asked, isn't it clear that evil is more powerful than good? And his answer was, no, it's not more powerful than good, but it is better organized. So we're up against a big, organized, I'm not going to say evil, but uh, so, so here's Emmanuel Cleaver, a former colleague of your senator, uh, who gave us this challenge. In effect, he, did, he doesn't know it, but this is the challenge that uh, Congressman Cleaver gave us. No agencies or organizations, excuse me, there are agencies that score us on everything. If you want to know what Harkin, how Harkin voted on the environment, on taxes, on education, on immigration, on NATO, you can find out his vote on every one of those things. And you can ch call him up and 
you leave a message saying you didn't meet the scores of the, uh, you know, the Nature Conservancy or the Re Reproductive Freedoms Group, whatever it is, there's no score on dignity. No score on civility. People just sort of say, oh, well, you know, that's part of the business. I'm not going to score them on that. So Cleaver left us with this challenge, so we took it on. Simple premise. No America without democracy. No democracy without healthy debate. We don't have this now. And there's no healthy debate unless you treat other people with dignity. You can say it's not rocket science, and you're right. <laughs> uh, so here's what we built. And uh, you've, got, you've got this in your hands, and we're going to play with it just for a minute here before we go to questions. Here's what we built. We built a scale that doesn't measure that we disagree, but how. So the premise here is that there's a very precise question in play, which is not what do you think about the border wall or open borders? Not in play. Uh, what do you think about the mill rate for property taxes in Des Moines? Not in play. What do you think about capital gains taxes? Not in play. What do you think about the ADA? Not in play. The only thing in play is how do I talk about you when we don't agree? So we set out to reveal to people the options about how to characterize the person you disagree with. At the bottom, they're not even human. They're animals. Unfortunately, you can find a lot of ones today. They're dogs. All this language, that's the lowest of the low. As you move up, you'll start to see slight tempering of the hatred and contempt. It's us or them moves up to it's us versus them. And as you move up, you start to hear the other side as a right to be heard. We talk to the other side. And when you get to the top, what I call, what Misha and I just labeled today, Club 78, uh, you start to hear people using the language you heard from Harkin earlier. We find ourselves at our best when we see the best in the other. No matter, remember this? No matter what. I know I have Democratic and Republican leaders here, and I can't wait for you guys to tell me I'm wrong about this. Uh, so let's do a little quiz. If you have it in front of you, we're going we're gonna to just do a little test. Uh, here's the first test. Uh, we, the people, are obliged to take responsibility ourselves to wipe out this scum. This is Leon Mugacera in Rwanda. And here's Heinrich Himmler. Whether nations live in prosperity or starve to death interests me only insofar as we need them as slaves for our culture. What do you give it? A zero or a one. That's a one. That top quote, I mean, I almost could say, well, I've seen it in the news recently. That's where it leads. It leads to a genocide that kills a million people in three weeks. All right, t that's a one. Oh, I, there's your answer. Uh, go, you go from violent words to violent action. Uh, the other side is less than human no longer deserve to live. It's our duty to destroy them. OK, ne test number two, your former colleague, uh, Senator uh, John McCain. Uh, Ruth, would you mind reading this out loud, just for fun? <laughs> <laughs> Starting from the top? Sure, why not? Thank you. 
screening, made in good faith that help improve lives and protect the American people. The Senate is capable of that. We know that. We've seen it before. I've seen it happen many times. And the times when I was involved even in a modest way was working out a bipartisan response to the national problem or threat are the proudest moments of my career and by far the most satisfying. Tom Beautifully read. Okay, you've had five minutes of instruction. Uh, check your scorecards. It's an open book quiz. What do you think? Pretty good. It's a six. It's a six. Level six sees it as a welcome duty. Finding common ground is part of who you are. All right, we've got to go fast here. Uh, who wants to read uh, uh, Mrs. Clinton? Do I have a volunteer or do I have to pick on somebody? Will you read for us? Thanks. You know, if you just read grocery and general interest, you could put half a truck to order into what I call the basket of deplorables, right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. And unfortunately, there are people like that. And we have lifted them up. We have given voice to their website that used to only have 11,000 people, now have 11 million. To preach and retreat their offensive, hateful, mean-spirited rhetoric. Now, some of those folks, they are irredeemable. But thank thankfully, they are not America. Hillary. What do you think? Four. Scoring panel four. What else? Three, two, two. It's a three. We're the good people. They're the bad people. And nobody thinks they're saying things with contempt because they think what they're saying is, in principle, they're the bad people. I'm the good person, right? So you don't even notice, and I, and I hope it's clear that we're not picking on Senator McCain or former Secretary Clinton or any of these people. We're, I'm just using these as examples, right? So this is not meant to in any way support or detract from a political agenda. We can't do that here, and I, that's not our goal. But you start to see that uh, how this starts to work. Last one. One last reader, one last volunteer. We're at a university. I'm a teacher. I have patience. Who will read? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are times when I look at some of those who are described as monsters, and I honestly believe, there, but for the grace of God, go I. I do not say this because I have some singular saying. I say this because I have sat with condemned men on death row. I have spoken with former police officers who have admitted inflicting the brutal torture. I have visited child soldiers who have committed acts of nauseating depravity, and I have recognized in each of them a depth of humanity that was a mirror of my own. Men have zero, the book of the living. Scorecard? That's an eight. I can see myself in every human being. He doesn't say he excuses the behavior. Doesn't say he agrees with what they did. Doesn't say they shouldn't be in prison. Doesn't say any of that. He just says, I see in you the same humanity that I see in myself. Imagine in the, in the midst of conflict if we had, if we were strong enough to marshal that energy. So quickly, we piloted this index in Utah uh, last year. We graded the Senate race, four congressional races. We got a ton of coverage. 
in the Utah uh, news. I won't bore you with all this, but just to say that you can start a conversation and people are interested. This is to say there's a market. You know, sometimes people think that's all nice and it's fine and well, and we're in this nice room, and Tom and Ruth are here, and they were great, but it's not realistic. Uh, no one really cares. That's not true. It's not true. There's a big market for this out there. Uh, Politico covered our colleague Tammy Pipe for a huge piece on uh, her presentations to this, uh, this work in the Republican circles, Republican women, very inflamed settings, and how she presented the, the index and how it moved people. Uh, which we call it the Bulwark covered it, and the uh, Dallas Morning News has covered it. <laughs> this was just after the State of the Union. And by the way, just to be clear, we, we've, we've developed this and we're promoting it, but we, we don't have a PR person who pitched any of these stories. These were all done by journalists picking it up, so to speak, seeing that there might be a story worth covering here. Here's, here's what we've learned, three quick things and then we'll, we'll, we'll shift pretty quickly. Uh, when people learn this, you, did, you got a three-minute overview. When people learn it, it has what we call an electrifying effect. People immediately get excited, almost. Now, you can prove me wrong and say, well, not tonight, not me. <laughs> uh, but we have found that people find in this a clarity that enables them to understand themselves and what's going on that they didn't see before. Not because we're geniuses, but just because it's so simple. You know, therapeutically, it's so simple, right? The sa second thing was a surprise. We thought we would use this to try to change political discourse. Most people take it and they want to use it for their family. <laughs> 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 and their friends, and their uncle, and their girlfriend, and uh, their professor who treated them so badly the other day, and all that kind of stuff. They, they're kind of interested in using it for politics, but they really want to have it for themselves. They want to, I, I presented this once to a group of USC students a couple, uh, well, about three months ago, and halfway through, this girl raised her hand and said, you know, I just realized I posted yesterday that this blankety blank blank Republican I'm defriending on my Facebook, and I, she said, I'm going to go take it down. I didn't need to do that. I didn't need to say that. It's not necessary. This is, I didn't say to her, you know, clean up your social media posts. Um, uh, and then this sense of agency. Remember we talked about how despairing people are, how discouraged they are? What we have found is with young people especially, but also with the governors, I'll say a little bit about that, a real sense of uh, agency. So here's the summary. Uh, the building blocks of the new culture following Sana. We get each other wrong. We've got to be brave. Name the problem, welcome the solution, measure, manage, and mobilize people. That's our goal. So I'm here, Senator, with a request. We want Drake to be part of this building block. We want to have Students for Dignity on this campus. Uh, Misha leads our national effort on this. We have chapters starting at, potentially at the University of Pennsylvania, at the University of Utah, at Brigham Young, at the University uh, Mich of Michigan. We want Drake to be on the forefront of this. Why not? It's a, it's a, it's a state where there's a lot of, yeah, let's, yeah, do we have a, do we have a student? I'm going to pick on people. So we, we have this, this Students for Dignity group, and this is like all new for me. Here's your QR code. <laughs> Misha just gave me this slide. So if you're interested in this, or if anyone on it, we'll obviously give you, you, you have this also on the handouts you've got. Uh, we think there's a grassroots movement here to be built around this simple premise that everybody deserves dignity. We don't think it has a Republican skew or a Democratic skew. We think it has a human skew that can change the way we treat each other in politics. We're also working with the governor, Spencer Cox, the head of the National Governors Association, is leading, he's the chair this year, and his whole initiative is what he calls Disagree Better, and we spoke there at the first meeting of the National Governors Association initiative on this. I'm going again in two weeks to Boulder. Uh, we hope to get five or ten governors to commit to the pledge and to commit to meeting with their opposing party. Just sit down. If you're a Democrat, sit down with the leadership of the Republican Party, vice versa. Read the index. Read the pledge. Commit to trying to raise your score. This is what Spencer does, the guy on the left here. Der Gerald Polis is the governor of Colorado. Both of them are on board with this. So it's not just grassroots, it's grass tops as well. We've got AI. 
uh, Berkeley, the Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence is building. Uh, we've got about 1,500 scores in. It's already about 98% accurate. We'll be able, within like about a month or two, to take every speech Harkin ever gave <laughs> and score it <laughs> like that. <laughs> And we'll see, like any speech I ever gave, or anything, any, or not, not speeches, but anything you ever posted, you'll be able to see your threes and your fours and how many sixes you got. And you could pull your Facebook feed for the last five years and score it. It'll not only score, it'll find the places where you characterize someone else. So it, won't re, it, won't, it doesn't score you, it just scores the speech where you point. You say, my friend George is, and then you fill in the blank, and it'll score that. It'll give you the score, tell you how many. So we'll be able to do this at scale, and we hope to be able to do this during the, during the presidential campaigns. This is the ch school stuff. I'm so, I'm so, I went too, too long, so I don't have time to go through all this. But just suffice to say that in the Salt Lake City School District, on their own, they're building classroom instructional modules uh, that teach some of these skills. These are some of the skills that help you move up. So when somebody threatens you or somebody uh, disagrees with you, how to be curious, not furious, you can teach this to fifth graders. You don't have to be a PhD. I mean, we like PhDs, but we don't have to be one. Self-regulation, take a deep breath when you're under attack. Not, not rocket science. No, most people don't do it. But I'm hoping you're seeing some almost like CBT-like things here, right? So acknowledge the ideas of people. The challenge ideas don't attack people. I vehemently disagree with the principles, the conclusions, the data, uh, the point of view you're bringing, uh, and here's why. You don't have to say you're a blank. You don't have to say that. It's not necessary. It doesn't help. So we don't have time to do this. Uh, let me, let's see if, can we, this is, can, can we, can we, can we can't, rewind I this? I can't hate this person. Can I pause, pause just for one I've second. Been, Is that possible? I just can't ha hate. So the, the slide you're about to see is, is on social media today. Misha just found it a couple of hours ago, so we just plugged it in here. This is a dad of someone who lost his son in Lewiston. Maybe you've seen it already on the way over. Uh, but we have a lot of role models, gang. We have a lot of role models of people who know how to treat other people with dignity. We've got to elevate them. Got to elevate them. Look, 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 look at look at this dad. I, I just can't ha hate him. I guess we can't make our choices on people, but I can't I can't hate this person. I've I've been taught different than that. I hope, anyways, and uh, I believe in the Lord, and uh, and I have to feel that way. If you hate and the hate drives you crazy, you're going to hurt people. And uh, I've had my ups and downs in my life, and uh, I don't want anyone to hurt me, and I don't want to hurt anybody. And I'm sure this man, uh, whatever happened to his mind, I'm sure he wasn't born to be a killer. And instead of, I'm sure, a father and a mother, that would have never believed this would have happened with him. Hate will never bring my son. Is it too much to ask a United States Senator, a United States Congressman, a mayor, a media executive? Is it really too much to ask them not to perpetrate hate for money? for votes, for power, for prestige, for attention. Is it really too much to ask? It's not too much to ask. But they're trapped. We're all trapped. we got to break out. That's our message. Last slide will sh show it to you again. So anyway, I'm sorry I went over a little bit too long, but thank you for your attention, and I now welcome, open the floor, and uh, invite you. Thank you. As mentioned earlier, we're using Google Voice to get your questions. If you have any questions, please type them in. We have a couple to start with. So first, um, what strategies can we use to treat people 
we fundamentally disagree with, such as perpetrators of war, violence, and genocide with dignity? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a very current topic. Uh, I think, you know, the, uh, the first message is if things are unsafe or there's violence or there's risk, you have to try to stop it. You don't have to excuse violence. I think you also have to recognize that when people have experienced violence, they're going to be deeply wounded and deeply angry and deeply full of contempt. That's not unnatural. It shouldn't be judged. I think the question we have to ask ourselves is in moments where violence and fear and enormous pain are present, is it best to act upon that to continue the cycle? The premise of this work is continuing the cycle is not likely to produce good outcomes. Uh, evidence of that, our view is, is quite uh, strong. So, Introducing even the littlest bit of dignity, we've seen this in the conflict right now in the Middle East where you hear people on both sides saying, I don't agree, I, I, what they've done is this, you, see, you saw it in this man right here. It's not acceptable, it's not good, it's broken my heart. I'm gonna try at least a little bit to treat the, in particular the innocent people with dignity. And there's no formula for knowing exactly where that leads us, but there's, there's a pretty clear conviction that the more we can introduce dignity into the, into the equation, even in moments of enormous pain and anger and frustration and violence and terrorism, uh, we, make, we make better decisions and more likely to end it. Uh, second question, uh, second audience question. How should academic institutions respond to some of the concerning interactions we see on college campuses between pro-Israel and pro-Palestine students? Well, I think, you know, I think, I think the, the question often centers on what is hate speech and what is, what is provoking violence versus what is free speech and what is provoking, what is inviting opinions. Uh, I think college campuses, like everybody else, has to figure out where that line is. I think too often canceling the other group leads to what I would call a cycle of canceling. I just don't think that gets us very far. People that complain about cancel culture on the left are now trying to cancel people on the left. <laughs> and people who have been canceled on the right and the left try to cancel back. It's, it's not particularly productive. Um, so I think the question we have with our students and with people who speak on these issues is to try to define the parameters of open discourse set boundaries for the capacity to disagree. I think one of the things that's not, that's been lost on this is when you hear, you know, when one side hears something that feels like terrorism to the other, they don't feel licensed to actually disagree with the merits. They only want to resort to an ad homin hominem attack on the, on, the, on the purveyor of the opinion. So that just reduces the chances that anybody will actually understand a pro-Palestinian or a pro-Israeli position at any level of depth. I don't think anybody has to condone terrorism. God willing, everybody in the world condemns it, or at least almost everybody can condemn it. Condemning it is the easy thing. Figuring out how to respond to it in a way that doesn't make it worse is the tough business. Thank you. Um, what can Drake students or students in general do to get involved with this organization and this movement? Do I go back to that QR code slide? <laughs> <laughs> This is the first time in my life I've ever made a pitch that didn't include, please give me money. <laughs> no, really, we would just like students to, to, to email us, and we'd like, we're starting chapters. This is a small movement. It's grassroots. It's just getting started. We've got a handful of young people uh, in their teens and 20s who have gotten excited about it. We'd like to find a handful here, and we think if we organize small numbers of committed people, I, I love the... Some of you may be fans of Margaret Mead. You know, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. Uh, so we're looking for a small group of committed people who just want to work like crazy with the conviction that we can make a difference. And uh, email, QR code, take a handout. Um, I'd say text DM me, but I don't know how to do that. Do you DM me? <laughs> 
But no, I mean, this is an immediate thing. We would like right now, like next week, to start Students for Dignity here. And we'd like one of the first things they do after they're trained is to request a meeting with the head of the Democratic Party and the head of the Republican Party. And we'd like them after that to ask for a, a meeting with the governor and then maybe with the senators and the Congress to explain to them from the kids, here's what we're trying to do. Help us, join us. I don't know whether, you know, and again, don't f feel free not to agree because we're, this is a sausage making movement. We're in the, <laughs> we're in the, we're in the creative period of, of what we hope will be a movement. Yeah. Is there any evidence that higher dignity scores might win elections? I would say uh, that, well, if you look at the presidential uh, elections, I don't know that there's much evidence. Uh, I think, you know, except 1960, of course. Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, you know. <laughs> um, but I think, actually, I, I, you know, I, w it would be a good study for a political scientist uh, student to look at this. I think, you know, Harkin wins in this state because he's got a level of decency and dignity that resonates with the majority of the people in the state. I think you see that a lot. I think there's a lot more people in Congress and in the Senate and in elective office at the state and local level who carry a good deal of this dignity and a good deal of this uh, uh, civility and uh, passion for their issues without being hateful that do win. They just don't get the airtime. So I don't, uh, I think there's plenty of examples where the more contemptuous person won. Just full disclosure, I, I, we're, I'm, we're not naive here. Um, but I think there's plenty of examples where the more, uh, the person with the higher level of dignity has won too. And uh, you know, I don't know where people feel about the, the last election, but I think if you'd scored Biden, and we, we have scored Biden, and we have scored Trump, and you'd be surprised at how diverse the scores are. Maybe, maybe you won't be surprised. But both candidates can, are, can move up the ladder, and both candidates and both, pr both presidents uh, are capable of moving down the ladder. I would suspect if we scored the last election that the candidate with higher dignity scores won, but I, don't, I, I can't say that for a fact. Maybe just make sure if there's anyone in the audience, because I'm dying for someone to c say, you're wrong. Come on. <laughs> While we wait for the next audience question, I'll ask one of my own. Could you okay. speak a little to what we had talked about earlier about contempt in the context of marriages and divorces and what yeah. you found there? Well, what we've, what we've, what we've, I've talked to a lot of clinicians, and I welcome you guys to jump in here if you'd like to. Uh, we've talked to a lot of clinicians about this, uh, trauma clinicians, systems therapists, a marriage therapist last week, I was talking to a very prominent marriage therapist about how dignity figures in mediating and heal, trying to heal disputes in, 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 in marriages. What we're hearing, I'm not a clinician myself, uh, what we're hearing is that the, a lot of the therapeutic project is to first try to help the individual find their own dignity. What's your own deepest? And, and one of the things you tick when you teach kids is you got to find your own strength in order to give and accord strength to other people. But encouraging people in a conflict to hear and see the dignity of the other is often a breakthrough moment in, in clinical experiences. But I, yes, please. Uh, we as practitioners, meaning me and Claudette. Yeah. And I probably speak for most practitioners. We have the luxury of a controlled setting right. where we have the two persons who are really angered, disillusioned, disappointed, and hostile at each other, there's a common kind of initiative that they want some healing at some level or other. Right. And we have that privilege of being invited into that context. Right. So it's more of a, an open setting. And because of that attitude, with goodwill and with a lot of hard work, people rediscover the goodness of one another. I use an axiom that says, if you want to renew a marriage, you move to the level of good communication and you move to fascination with the beauty and the dignity of the other, and it renews things. That's yeah. often been lost. Yeah. In the political forum, you don't have that luxury. I don't know how you would do that because it's you don't, you a mega don't. model. Well, that's the question. The question is, you know, when I started on this and people said, well, you have to change the culture. I was like, I had worked like 10 years to try to change fifth grade. Mm -hmm. You know, like where everything is controlled, right? Yeah. Where you have, mm -hmm. you know, you have 10 months and you have all this mm -hmm. control. 
So a culture has a lot of levers of change. And I'm not an expert on this. I'm not like a social scientist in this area. But I do think that we see in recent times levers that can move cultural discourse quite quickly. We see it over long periods of time a lot. I mean, let's be blunt. People would go to a lynching in their Sunday clothes 100 years ago. It, that's not, that's not accepted today, right? The culture changed. The meaning making changed. The value system changed. The capacity to see and communicate and hear each other. Uh, the LGBTQ story is a very rapid change. Where, wherever you are on the issue, it changed a lot in a short period of time, like five, seven, ten years. Now, yes, there was tons of work and pain and struggle that led up to it, but it changed pretty quick. A uh, couple of things, a couple of levers, a couple of things, and all of a sudden what was once normal is now scorned, right? That's what we're looking for here. We're looking for, can you create, in a, almost like a quasi-therapeutic sense, a communication pattern mm -hmm. that all of a sudden unlocks for people some fascination with the other, almost exactly the, the trajectory you just described, that makes you go at the end, oh my god, I can't believe I ever said that. Like I, I Almost like mm -hmm. it's no longer cool to call people names. That's not cool anymore, don't you know? We did this in a small way in the Special Olympics movement with the R word. If I were in an audience like this 15 years ago when we started this, I'd say, how many people have used the R word, the word retard? And you know, one or two hands would go up, and I'd say, OK, come on. And then you know, if I gave it time, every hand goes up. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying we eradicated it, mm -hmm. but it's not as cool to call someone that word as it was. So I, I think there are levers of change in a culture. Some people say influencers, you know, if you, oh, if you could only get Taylor Swift or Beyonce or something like that, <laughs> then it would be great. If you could get the president and the, you know, if you get Donald Trump, it would be great. Now, all that matters. Influencers matter in terms of creating the context for that communication that you have in this controlled setting. But I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. And I think the bottom up way is, is a big part of it. And that's why. Honestly, that's why I'm here, because I would, we'd love to have this place be a hub, you know, help us build and maybe create the communication here. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, people will say, you know, at Drake, they handled the next conflict really well. And this is how they did it. They have a code of conduct. They have a freshman orientation where they teach people how to disagree with dignity. Mm -hmm. Professors challenge people when they disagree to use these codes. I don't know. That's our hope. Yes, in the back. Um, do you think dignity, um, th this mindset, would positively or in any way affect the American, ed the American education system in any way? Yeah, I think in, so, you know, mentioned a little bit that I was in the field of what we call social and emotional learning. So that whole field was designed to train people in empathy and perspective taking and self-regulation. And, it, and it's being taught well. And it has a huge effect on test scores. It has an effect on sense of safety in school. It has an effect on dropout rates. When people feel safe, when people feel heard, when people feel like they're not going to be attacked, they learn better. This is, one, this is a new tool. Uh, uh, that I think what we're hearing from educators now, this is not me, and again, a lot of this is a Utah-based example because that's where we've been. Uh, the Salt Lake City superintendent came, I was, we were there 10, 10 days ago, and she came on her own with 15 teachers because she's creating the Salt Lake City uh, a Dignity School District initiative. And the student government groups are all, you know, one of the things that's nice for teachers, I don't know if there's any teachers or former teachers here, like, oh, I can teach this, right? Ready to go. On the back, there's a website. I can pull down. I can drop down boxes. I can give examples. That's teachable, right? It's not like I got to go do research. It's, it's sort of done. So I think it can make a difference in schools, and I think it can make a difference. You know, people say, what about free speech? If I were to ask you in this room, have you had your speech constrained in the last week? Have you not said something you wish you, you wanted to say? Almost everybody would say yes. And almost everybody would say the reason they don't say it is because they're afraid of the contempt they'll experience if they say the wrong thing. 
So our kids are feeling that. And there's nothing worse for learning than fear. Nothing. Nothing constrains, from the brain science, from the developmental science, from the mental health science, nothing constrains learning worse than fear and stress, uh, at least at toxic levels. So if we can make it feel safe to ask a question about something that's sensitive, sexual orientation, gender, race, culture, all these different things, make it possible for kids not to feel that if they ask the wrong question, they won't get treated with, oh my God, you idiot, oh, how dare you, how could you? You better get out of here. No one's going to like you. I think it can make a big difference. Yes, sir. Uh, the, um, this will be our last question. I didn't get my Republican and Democrats fighting. That's what I. <laughs> a, a lot of what you talked about is uh, one Democrat, one uh, politician attacking another politician. But what you implied with some of your quotes that you did at the end was really the attack about the other. You know, the attack about the other group. Right. And I think that is what really is the most toxic in politics today, right. is uh, the attack about the other group. And how, how do we really handle that uh, aspect in our politics today? Yeah. Because I think that's what's really driving most of the divide uh, in our yeah. society. Yeah. They have this opinion. They're doing this to us. They're going to attack us. They're the problem. They, whatever they is. Uh, so I think disaggregating it is, is really, it's, I, I don't think it's that different than just actually realizing that contempt about a group is a particularly virulent form because it actually, I don't just say Tom is evil. I know Tom. I met Tom. I'm related to Tom. He's evil. That at least implies some degree of knowledge. Th Republicans are evil, or MAGA people are evil, or Democrats are evil, or woke people are evil, or urban dwellers are evil, or Jews, or Muslims, or... That's, that's a level of cognitive dissonance and disorientation that is on its nature, by its nature, absurd, right? You can't, there's no way you can't, you, how would you know? <laughs> you can't know a million people. So the, the premise here is that simply asking people not to characterize other groups with contempt. Like, you can disagree with Republicans. It's fine. I was raised to disagree with Republicans. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, and actually, to be honest, I know we're out of time. I'm not proud of a lot of the ways which, when I look back, I mean, I've learned a lot, just speaking for myself, I've learned a lot through this process. I mean, Last co comment, I won't pick on him because he, I love my father to death and he's not here anymore. But he told me when I was about 12 years old that the one person who could never go to heaven was Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> and like we were on the way home from church when he told me that. <laughs> I was like, I don't think that fits with what we just heard. And he's like, oh no, oh no. Uh, if you get to heaven, you're not going to find Richard Nixon there, I'm telling you. <laughs> So, look, there's plenty of guilt to go around on these things, but I, I do think that the basic premise of group hate is not that different from individual. And I think the same thing could apply. Josh, do you want the last word? Or you're sitting politely in the back, newly elected representative of the... No? You want, you want nothing to do with this topic? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>